murder charge against him. And Soldier Slim's death became a cold case. The community won't cooperate because I'm not going to finger you as that violent felon because if I know you're on the streets in five days, guess who's the next victim? Me. And I don't want that. In 2005, a Crime Commission report revealed that due to the 60-day law and the city's code of silence, only 7% of those arrested in New Orleans were ever convicted. Any outcry that stunning crime report might have stirred was blown away within days. On August 29th, Hurricane Katrina took aim at the Big Easy. It would change everything, even for the Gotti boys. People thought the world was coming to an end. The Gotti boys, one of New Orleans' most notorious gangs, ran the Big Easy until August 29th, 2005. That's when a Category 5 hurricane put the mouth of the Mississippi in its bullseye. At 6.10 a.m., Hurricane Katrina made landfall south of New Orleans before turning east toward Mississippi. The Big Easy felt the wrath of the storm surge, which flooded the city. It was complete chaos. We lost total communication. We had a complete collapse of the infrastructure. The two most valued commodities after the storm was bottled water and dry ammunition. Survivors were starved for food and water. They quickly began looting for the bare necessities. Even the Gotti boys weren't prepared for the lawlessness. My sister and her family was on the interstate, lived on the interstate for a week, telling me that she saw uh, a guy killed his sister over a bag of ice. It's crazy. People breaking into people's house, thinking they got food in them. I had nothing, nothing but the clothes on my back. That's it, that's all I had. Dip was one of hundreds who sought refuge on rooftops. He and his family were rescued by helicopter and taken to a staging area on top of a causeway. From there, they boarded a bus out of town. I ain't knew where I was going, and really, I didn't care. I was kind of frustrated at that time, you know, not knowing what was going on, you know. I knew I, well, I thought the city was true. Uncle Laurel, who had spent his life in one of the most dangerous projects in New Orleans, walked into a living hell at the Superdome, the place where more than 25,000 sought shelter. It was a catastrophe at the bottom line. I don't really like talking about the dome because I, I go to thinking about the smell. I got a weak stomach. There was no food, no water, and no electricity. They did, however, have guns. It was like you're on the streets. I mean, man, they had garbage cans full of guns and them. Some people they were checking, some people they wouldn't. I've been in some godforsaken places. This is as close as I've seen to anarchy in my life. For up to five days, the survivors lived in squalor. A few lost all hope. At least one man committed suicide off the upper deck of the Superdome. We got people jumping off the terrorist section, feeling like it's no tomorrow. Like the water, people didn't know when that water was going to stop rising. Finally, the buses arrived, taking the storm's victims, citizens as well as criminals, to a holding area in Houston, Texas. Houston PD had no idea what kind of gangsters were coming their way. We were somewhat blindsided, I think, uh, only because we did not understand that element, uh, that lifestyle over there. Uh, there's no word to describe it other than chaos. I mean, it was just absolute chaos. Many New Orleans residents had lost their identification in the flood. There was no way to tell who was whom. Suddenly you had a group of people who realistically were unknowns. I mean, they were ghosts because their IDs, everything was gone. 
the Houston authorities began randomly assigning evacuees to whatever housing was available. They were just put place to place to place to place. So all these people that hung out with their homeboys back at the complex back in New Orleans had no idea where their friends were. Or their enemies. The Gotti boys armed themselves. If you had a gun in New Orleans and a Katrina took it and that's the only way you felt safe, you buy you a gun in Houston. You gonna buy you anything that you feel like gonna put you back in a home state of mind. In New Orleans, the Gotti boys had only one rule, anarchy. It was, it was more of a free-for-all. You just kind of go out and do your thing. The streets of Houston were a different ballgame. Here, gangs like MS-13 and the Bloods were well organized. There are many gangs here that, that have structure like the military. They'll have a, a general, a second general, captains, lieutenants, all the way down to foot soldiers, and they operate in that manner. Houston's street rules were different, and the Gotti boys had to change their methods. They didn't want to be caught wearing a red rag or a blue rag or a black rag or a white rag, so they started wearing camouflage. And on their camouflage knit hats or baseball hats, they would have 504 to distinguish themselves as being from New Orleans. When the money from FEMA started flowing, it created another problem for Houston. Gang members used it to buy cars. Now, they were mobile. Old allies found one another and a way to use their cash to make even more money. You get a check for $4,000, well shoot, you go spend 2,000 on some cocaine and then go distribute it for a profit. Money was being dished out to people who were not accustomed to having it. Within months, several Houston clubs decided to host New Orleans nights. It backfired as old rivalries were reignited. They would show up at these places and they would see somebody they didn't like and they would take them out. It was chaos, it was, it was killing for no reason at all. It was robbing, it was stealing, it was burglarizing. Ain't nothing changed, it just, it just was a different environment, that's all. While the old wars raged, new ones over drug turf were starting with the Houston gangs. The New Orleans gangs showed no mercy. They kill you in a heartbeat. The regard for human life, uh, there was none. Houston was now overrun by the same kind of hardcore criminals that had terrorized New Orleans for decades. It was almost as though they lived by the minute. If I have to kill you to get to the next five minutes, then I kill you and I move forward. And it was no big deal. In the three months following Katrina, Houston recorded 379 homicides, up 13% from the same time frame the year before. When they move, the murder rate go up wherever they at. Go check Houston. Check Dallas and Atlanta. Murder rates gets jacked up when New Orleans in the building. New Orleans gangsters were bold, some tattooing a green cross between their eyes. The mark would identify a hardcore killer. Once they got their fifth kill, they would have that cross on their forehead. We probably came across six or seven different guys that had that cross on their forehead. They had no qualms about shooting multiple people within two or three months here in Houston. The Gotti boys were in for a big surprise. The 60-day rule didn't apply in Texas, meaning if you did the crime, you had to do the time. They would just tell us, yeah, it's a 60-day murder, I'll be out in 60 days. And we would tell them, well, no, <laughs> you're not. They wouldn't understand. And you would literally have to let them sit there for 60 days and come day 61, they're like, well, what happened? I'm still here. It was almost re-educating them to what a justice system was. The Houston PD also refused to be stonewalled by the code of silence practiced on the streets of New Orleans. We developed a strategy that if they refused to give their name, if they gave us false information, they could be charged with a crime in Texas called uh, fair to give information or fair to ID as a witness. The Gotti boys were feeling the heat. 
police up there started getting real, real strict. And they started getting, you know, they started like reading us, you know. So once they saw the saggy pants, they knew it was us, you know, so they really was you know, with us. New Orleans gangs were frustrated by the tougher laws of Texas and quickly headed back to the Big Easy. What they found blew their minds. When I came back, it just looked, it looked different. You ain't, you ain't really know what was what. There was no nothing. It was absolutely devoid of what we understand society should operate within. Spring 2006. 